But dynamic land is a communal computer where the computer is the room. It's a new dynamic medium to think about systems with other people. And uh, so if you can imagine concretely, you're in a room, but the entire room is the computer. And what's interesting about dynamic land is it kind of breaks the assumption that programming is inherently tied to abstract thinking. If you can take uh, computation out of the realm of abstraction and put it in the realm of uh, the physical world, it it kind of breaks down this barrier. If you can interact with physical objects, now you can interact with a uh, computational medium. Hi, this is Will. And this is Shree. Welcome to the Technium, where we talk about the edge of technology and what we can build with it, an optimistic look at the road ahead. Hey Shree, how's it going? Very good. I had a super productive week and I am really excited to be recording again. So yeah, how about That's you? That's good. It's pretty good. Had the, the usual week, but I'm all ready for our episode to talk about this week. But first, what are we drinking? Yeah, so today I've got yet another new and weird drink. I've got Dram, ginger grass, but most importantly, plus hemp. So I don't know what it's gonna do uh, to me over the course of our recording. Maybe I'll get really high, but well, yeah, we'll see. When I saw that, I was like dynamic Dram, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How about you? I have this like Korean barley powder mix, I guess. You put it in water. It's like 15 different kinds of grains with yams. Mm. And so I guess you can put it in ice water or milk. But since I am lactose intolerant, <laughs> ice water it is. Nice. Very cool. I right. thought you were going to say you're just going to down that. Like you just No, 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 no. <laughs> no, like I'm, I've had somebody suggest to me that I should find ways to be lactose tolerant as a hobby, and I couldn't imagine like a worse way to spend a weekend. <laughs> All right, well, I'm glad you're not uh, in experimenting with that while we're right. while we're recording. But uh, yeah, <laughs> so what are we talking about this week? So this week we're talking about Dynamic Land, and uh, have you heard of Dynamic Land? I have. I've seen little uh, tidbits uh, from here and there on on Twitter, but it's very intriguing, and I think they're pretty closed off about their development. So yeah, I'd love to you know hear more. Yeah. And so as a caveat for this episode, like what we know about Dynamic Land is gleaned from like little snippets here and there on Twitter and some like out of the way blog posts. And so some of these are maybe two or three years old. And so they might have improved it a lot since then. I've heard that there is a 2020 version that I haven't seen any content about, but we'll, we'll just talk about what we know about today. And so Dynamic Land is a communal computer where the computer is the room. It's a new dynamic medium to think about systems with other people. And uh, so if you can imagine concretely, you're in a room, but the entire room is the computer. So there's not the traditional sense of a keyboard, mouse, and screen. And uh, on the table and on the wall and everywhere, there are these sheets of paper that are bordered by colored dots. And these colored dot paper, these pieces of paper do a little bit of functionality. Like each one is a little bit, bit, bit of functionality. And some of these pieces of paper have images projected on them, such as numbers, shapes, and colors, and they represent data. And in order to construct a program, you see people around the table putting together programs by rearranging these pieces of paper around. And by putting them next to each other, you can take the results from one paper and display them on another. So for example, you might have a uh, piece of paper whose functionality is to put googly eyes on another piece of paper right next <laughs> to it. And so just, just for a quick example. And so anytime you put it on a table, there's a projector that projects the image on that piece of paper. So there are cameras everywhere. They recognize the piece of paper and the program that's supposed to be running on that piece of paper. And then when it's put next to another piece of paper, whatever it is, like this piece of paper with the googly eyes functionality, we'll put googly eyes on another one. And so in this way, <laughs> you can kind of remix uh, functionality to create programs in a collaborative way and in a way that allows you to think with your hands, think collaboratively with other people. Mm -hmm. And it's very different than the way that we usually think about computers as the devices that we have with these touch panel screens and keyboards and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. 
so I think somewhere in our post editing, we're going to kind of overlay some pictures for the viewers to to see. But if you're listening to this on audio, I highly recommend checking out some of the resources in the show notes because it is a way of interacting with computing that is different than any other way that I've seen before. It goes all the way from the aesthetic to the functionality. So I think one thing that really stood out to me about Dynamic Land, seeing the demos, is how playful it seems, where you know all the pictures uh, and videos of, of people interacting with Dynamic Land, it seems really fun. They are kind of moving around these pieces of paper and using them as uh, controls, using them as displays, and and just generally being really mobile, mobile as in they are moving their bodies around and interacting with these kind of living systems. This these pieces of paper are basically representations of some kind of logic, dynamic logic. But not only are they representations of of a program, but they are themselves an embodiment of the program. So you can move them around, and that movement of that piece of paper actually might have some meaning. It could be an input to the program. It could modify the behavior of the program in some way. And so it is a very physical, tactile way of thinking about logic and programming systems. Times people talk about like some industry or something that's reimagined, and a lot of that is marketing hype. But like yeah. this is just, like you said, completely different than what we've seen before. Yeah, so this is a complete different way of reimagining what computing could be. Because right now when we think about using computers, a lot of it is sitting in front of a device and looking at flat screens. And the realization that the primary researcher of Dynamic Land, Brett Victor, had was that people think in a lot of different ways and that humans have certain thing certain universals that are not satisfied by our computing devices today and we can get to that later and so he tried to create something that was that fit human universals uh, a lot better such as thinking with our bodies and by manipulating things by moving through space uh, rather than just symbol manipulation and doing things together so yeah and and, uh, and that people want to have agency in the things that they create instead of the world that we have today where there's basically two classes of computer users, programmers, and everybody else because, you know, programmers are the only ones that can create uh, dynamic things and, like, dynamic representations of systems in this dynamic medium we call computer, computing computers, and then there's everybody else that, that has to consume it. Yeah, totally. And we talked about this in the end-user programming episode as well. One thing that is something I love about dynamic land is that you can kind of think about it from the very uh, minuscule details of what it's like to interact with this all the way up to really grand ideas about what it means to build a community around you know computational thinking and having communal spaces and what benefit that provides in order to kind of develop this shared logic and shared memory and so I mean, we can we can run up and down this sort of ladder of abstraction, as Brett Victor reference. But so, exactly. you know, let's let's start let's start with the the really concrete aspect of it. What is it like to interact with Dynamic Land? And caveat: neither of us have interacted with it, so we're going to go off of other people's accounts. But yeah, what 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 do people say it's like? Yeah, and also like even just reading the accounts, it has to be caveated with a lot of times people don't write down their experience because the the experience of interacting in dynamic land and the way that you learn about it is that you go to the space and if you don't understand something you just ask somebody and or like you look at it and you play around with it and so there's a lot of things that aren't written down it, it's mm -hmm. almost kind of it goes back to an oral tradition for computing which is strange yeah. like it goes back to an oral tradition for the dynamic medium in which we've always use the written medium for for transmitting knowledge yeah. and so the the experience is not as much written down and so from what we can glean though from people that have written about it from people that tweeted about it from people that have posted about it is that it's it's surprisingly social i think it is one thing like normally when we compute together 
most people like collaborate remotely to begin with, right? And then if mm -hmm. they're in the same space, at best, you can just sit around a table with laptops, like looking at your screens. You're not really directly interacting with each other. Like yeah. at LAN parties, maybe at best you might like slap somebody on the shoulder for a good <laughs> job. Like when you, when you see like the Overwatch teams competing or something like that. Right. And, but in dynamic LAN, like the objects of computation are reified in the real physical world. And so it feels more like a board game experience where you're interacting with everybody around the table and you're moving the like the the digital computational objects which is the colored pieces of paper around to explore yeah. possibilities and it's not like you also have to like take turns you can just kind of use the social cues and like the conversational cues that we already have built in in order to figure out when you should change things like there's no need to build in access lists or yeah. like concurrency mechanisms because like that's already all built in into like social constructs that we've honed and tuned for the better part of 10, 20,000 years, I guess. How old are human beings? I think something, something on the order. Yeah, something on that years. order. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, so I think the thing that really set the framework for me to understand dynamic land was a talk by Brett Victor called seeing spaces. Mm -hmm. And he goes into the concept that we have, spaces for other types of creation that are communal spaces so you can think of uh, you know woodworking shop or an auto garage or you know a painter's studio and these are places where maybe multiple people work and all of the tools of creation are there they're embodied by definition because you know paintbrush is real you know saw is real and so That's you can—it's it's just like most everything in the world is non-fungible, so it doesn't make right. sense to say like these <laughs> things are embodied because like that's right. the default for the physical world. It's only like in contrast to the digital world that we're like, oh, we have to actually do work to embody these things. Yeah, exactly. So it goes without saying, but I think we should say it. it. Like, and so if you go into those kind of spaces, you can see what other people are making. You can, you know, potentially riff off of those things. And so, especially in. in you know, artistic space, like let's say a music studio or something where you can hear what other people are doing and potentially come by and add your own little riff or, or kind of just jam with them uh, and get inspired. And so these are these kind of communal spaces for creation. And this stands in stark contrast with if you go to your standard tech company office, you, what you see is a bunch of people with noise canceling headphones on staring at flat monitors with incredibly limited range of motion and nobody's really talking. You can't really see how they're collaborating. There's some collaboration obviously happening, but there's not really a sense that they're working together in a you know, perceivable way. And so Brett Victor has this vision of seeing spaces, which is this kind of communal workshop for people who are, who are seeing, who are, observing and modifying these dynamic systems that we call software programs. And so what would that kind of, you know, tinkering workshop look like for people who are all working together and building this interactive experience? Well, I think dynamic land is, is working toward that, toward that goal. I always kind of chuckle when people say they want to visit Silicon Valley or in, inside the tech company because there's really not anything to look at because yeah. like the the action is really going on in the systems that you like I guess they're all digital right somebody would have to like take yeah. you through the screens to, to see something but like the people do collaborate inside of tech companies it's just that when the bandwidth that you need go like the ideas that you want to express goes beyond the constrained bandwidth of a slack channel <laughs> Or, or something like that. They're like, oh, let's get up and get into a conference room and let's whiteboard it out or whatever it is, right? right. And, and then they have to take what they figured out to be a shared understanding and then translate that into code. And so that kind of, it abstracts it a little bit. It's, it's like a separate thing. And so what I understand seeing spaces to be is that they should be in the same, they, they should be one in the same. Like you should be able to be in the same room with somebody else to figure out a shared understanding of the problem and the solution and the model and be able to use embodied version, like reified versions of the digital objects to explore that space or come up with a solution together. Yeah. 
And I think this is honestly what people are approximating in their work in tech companies where you know we're recording this in the middle of a pandemic where there's a big shift to remote work. And one of the arguments against remote work, at least early on in this pandemic, was that you lose some high bandwidth communication. And so the, the most commonly cited example that I heard is these so-called hallway conversations where you kind of bump into your coworker in the hallway and you're like, oh, hey, like, what are you working on? And then they tell you kind of what they're working on and you somehow get inspired and say, oh, I have a good idea for you. Why don't you try this? And somehow this type of hallway conversation is, is lost uh, in the transition to remote work. And similarly with kind of whiteboarding and like huddles and whatever you want to call it. And so these are all basically just kind of approximations of, of what you know, having a communal environment is. These are just kind of ways that we get around not having a shared medium by which we can all look at something and work together. But yeah, I think that's, that's sort of what people mean. This is what people sort of desire, but it doesn't really exist. I was going to say, as an aside, have you ever been inspired by a hallway conversation? Because I've never been. I have never been inspired by a hallway conversation. <laughs> I think it's just one of those like made up situations, honestly. But, but I, I think well, what I want to get at is what where he's imagining just doesn't exist right now, except in other industries. Like in other industries, like you said, there's like a, a kitchen or like a design studio or like an... I don't know, car mechanic shop. Like these are spaces mm -hmm. in which people can diagnose something together. They're like, they, they have the thing in front of them and they interact with it directly to collaborate and figure out. Whereas I think all the things that you mentioned as collaboration that are supposed to be benefits of working together in the same area, those are, those are still one step removed from the digital thing because the digital objects aren't embodied like there's no physical version of them and so this that, that's one of the main differences with dynamic land and, and so people's accounts of it is things like when you're collaborating like on the programs where in the color dots when somebody is explaining something to you like there's a video of somebody just casually picking up another sheet of paper and looking at it as a reference and that was kind of a small moment, but it stands in stark contrast to when you're pair programming and, you know, one person's driving and then the other person is looking at it. And how many times have you said, wait, 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 can you scroll back to where you define that function? Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so dynamic land, like it, it facilitates like the program on the table facilitates the conversation because like people can casually like look at another program as a reference while somebody is explaining another part of the program. Right. Or. Yeah. Or like when somebody is walking by and they spot somebody else doing something, then they can actually have a real hallway conversation like going, oh, what, what is this? This looks interesting. Or if you catch somebody going by, you're like, I need help with this one thing and can't quite figure it out, right? And this is what I'm talking about, that there's an oral history to the people that frequent dynamic land. And so it, they, they don't ever really write it down. And so that's why we don't have a lot of, that's one reason why we don't have a lot of documentation on it. Yeah, I think... Brett Victor even has uh, a whole talk about when, you know, kind of words, uh, words are not enough. And so, yeah, I think what, what really excites me is the idea that you can be working on something and when you're, when you're stuck, you can bring somebody over and they're able to gain the same context that you had because that context is laid out right in front of you. And so if you are encountering some bug or some buggy behavior, they can come over and they can just tinker with it or observe how that behavior changes with different inputs without having to say, hey, can I you know, jump on the keyboard or hey, can you type this in? Or like you said, can you scroll up here or, or down there? And so it removes a lot of the barriers to entry that you would otherwise have. And it makes a certain type of collaboration basically frictionless because we already as human beings have the social capabilities to be able to collaborate that way. It's just that our tools don't really allow it. Yeah. I, I think that's one thing that uh, is, it goes back to some of the principles of dynamic land. The first being that uh, it's a, 
dynamic medium that is a humane representation for thought. And what it means to be humane is that it caters to how human beings are. And one of the main things is that we're communal. Like we like to do things together. We like to think together. And a dynamic lens supports this more than like a lot of the, actually every other system that I can think of, like every other dynamic system I can think of that we like make in computers. Yeah, totally. Another thing that I, I thought was really interesting is that one advantage to having this room scale computing environment is that people can leave little bits of running programs, little demos around. And from what I'd seen in some of the, the videos and blog posts, people were able to kind of see that and riff on it and maybe add their own contribution to that or, or add their own remix to that. And so we don't really have a place to do that when we don't have a shared sense of place in computing. I can run a server, but you're not ever going to see that server running and say, hey, this looks interesting. Let me go poke around or, hey, let me put my uh, version of this demo next to this other person's running demo because there's no concept of next to. I can run my own server. I can modify your source code and, and run my own version of it, but there's no place that people can look around and see all these things running and be able to situate their contributions next to the things that they're related to. It's all just sort of disconnected. Yeah, we, we have. And so there are advantages to that, but like the best that we have is something like GitHub where you can kind of see the code, but that code is dead. It's not running. Like you can't like play around with the co running code on GitHub or anything like that and be able to like take it and remix it and, and do something with it. And and so I like what you said about like it's situated in space because like we live in space and so we have some sort of spatial reasoning with like this is over here and if I move through space, like there's a relationship here that like I can map the relationship of some sort of data to the space that I'm moving around in. It makes me understand that a lot more, right? Mm -hmm. And that is just completely non-existent in a lot of the systems that we have. And so this is kind of another, one of the second values of dynamic land in which it goes back to the humane representation of thought for dynamic systems in that it helps us think about problems in systems using faculties outside of simple manipulation because like every programmer out there to some degree is like good at abstract symbol manipulation and yeah. if you aren't uh i guess you went and did something else and, and so there's there's no way for people to like think with their hands like by manipulating things or like i know for dancers there's like a kinesthetic sense and Mm -hmm. I have to say I'm really completely lacking on that. Like it doesn't really make sense for me to like really relate to like, what's it mean to think with your body? And it, it's a little hard to describe probably, but I, I do understand that there, there are types of knowledge that is hard to verbalize. And if you're able to move your body in the same way and go through the same dance, you, you get some transference of knowledge or a feeling like it's not like a concrete knowledge in the kind of the liter literary or the mathematical sense but a, a sense of an experience or a feeling right and so yeah. that I, I i can buy right and so we we dynamic land tries to have that use of faculty beyond just abstract simple manipulation as part of computing and a computing environment so one thing that I think a lot about is the fact that human beings are able to do really complex behavior that they themselves are not able to verbalize or able to read and then repeat. So if you think about the process of driving a car, you know how to drive a car, assuming you learned at least once, and you know the behavior of how turning your wheel or braking a certain way is going to affect the motion of this car. And that is dictated by some very, very complex dynamic behavior that is uh, defined by physics. And you would never ever be able to tell somebody, hey, this is the equation by which the car's turning radius is related to the angle of your steer at a certain speed. But you not know, just equation, it like not, not like you can't even write down an algorithm. That's why I like that. We have to turn to machine learning, like the deep learning stuff to f tell cars how to drive themselves. Yeah, exactly. I, I, but somehow we have this sense and I think we have a lot of intelligence that is 
just sort of baked into our physical senses that we wouldn't be able to otherwise verbalize. And what's interesting about dynamic land is it kind of breaks the assumption that programming is inherently tied to abstract thinking. We kind of think about that a lot and a lot of these debates about diversity in computing and women in computing and things are, are centered around these sort of neuroscience based research that certain type of people are better at spatial reasoning or they're better at symbol manipulation or blah, 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 blah. And I don't want to get into the controversy of that or the veracity of those claims. But what's interesting about dynamic land is it says computation doesn't have anything inherently to do with abstract thinking. If you can take a computation out of the realm of abstraction and put it in the realm of uh, the physical world, it, it kind of breaks down this barrier. Now you don't have to have this debate about who is a programmer, what traits do they have to have, what is the neurotype of those people. It kind of says, well, if you can interact with physical objects, now you can interact with a computational medium. Yeah, and so to, to make that concrete, like what, what does that mean? Like one of the demos that I've seen for Dynamic Land is like a wind tunnel application where one of the colored sheets of paper, from now I'll just say sheet of paper, the sheet of paper had these flow lines on top of it. And when you put any other physical object on top of it, like a car, like the the projected image of the flow line on the paper, it would stream around the car as if it was in a wind tunnel. And that's a way where you can kind of test out the drag for various objects and you can manipulate it physically directly on the table. And that's a way to think with your hands rather than, you know, try to manipulate the flow equations to figure out what, what is it exactly this thing is doing and write it out as, as a program to, to be able to see the results. Yeah. You know, if you look at the, body of Brett Victor's work. He's he's very prolific in, in coming up with lots of very, very interesting and eye-catching demos. And you can see that theme thread throughout his work of letting people understand how systems change in response to their inputs or being able to visualize the effects of you know, modifying one thing on the output of the system. And it's funny, if you look at a lot of the reaction to Brett Victor's work, it loses that point and instead focuses a lot on, oh, I saw that you were, you know, you had implemented a text editor that allows you to scrub the numbers, you know, using your mouse or, you know, click on a hex value and, and change that you know, using a color picker. And people like really picked up on these like, implementation details and lost the idea that it wasn't about the like the text editor that had all these affordances it was about allowing you to visualize what would happen in in various sort of counterfactual realities and i, I think brett victor had said as much in in some interview where people had pigeonholed him into this guy who was all about you know, programming environments. And in fact, he was much yeah. more interested in like some much higher ideals than that. Yeah, yeah. He kept getting invited to like programming tooling and programming environment conferences. And like, no, no, I'm not that guy. Like, I, I, like in his own words, I think he is more interested in how to understand systems and complex systems. And it's only incidental that he's using computers to do it. And I think in the same way, like he feels kind of, he, he shares that with Alan Kay in, in, in like, some interview notes of uh, Steve Krauss, who runs like Future of Computing. Like he, he quotes Brett Victor as saying that uh, Alan Kay is one of the greatest philosophers of our time, but everybody knows him as this object oriented programming guy. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I think part of it is just, well, Alan Kay, he needs somebody like a graphic designer or somebody better to do his slides. Like he's, <laughs> he's com communicating some deep ideas there, but I think he's having some trouble communicating it and but on the other hand like new ideas just take a lot of a lot of time and a lot of like different people to really like grasp what it is that you're trying to tell them and so 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 i think that these are all contributing factors here but yeah like i think the thing to keep in mind is that for brett victor i think he's coming from a, a place where he's recognized that civilization 
has made leaps because we've had these mediums to represent our thoughts and things to think in, such as writing and language and mathematical notation. And these things have enabled us to make leaps, technological or otherwise, like, you know, what is, what is Martin Luther? Like he nailed those things on the door. I mean, without words and printing press, like you can't get lots of people to follow him and these ideas, right? And so he recognized that we have this dynamic medium called computers now, but we just don't have good dynamic representations for us to directly manipulate. Like there's a huge lag time between like us wanting to try an idea. Like we have to like sit there and program our machines to be able to finally like see like the results of that. And so one of his more famous talks called Inventing on Principle, it's it, the core idea is that creators should be directly connected with the things that they're manipulating rather than being disconnected or abstracted because most of the time us programmers like we're typing text into a text editor and then trying to make something else happen right we're not directly yeah. manipulating the things usually not anyways and so so yeah that that was the the inventing on talk the inventing talk was what got him on the map and what a lot of people mistook him as a programming tools guy rather than a <laughs> oh new represent humane representation of thought for investigating dynamic mediums guy and so that's yeah. that's like a word wordy thing and he probably needs like a shorter shorter representation for that yeah and so with that said you know i i think we're gonna kind of you know, go go up and down this ladder of abstraction many times during this podcast but let's let's bring it back down right so we so we it. we talked about the the high order bits of the the philosophy but how does this whole room scale computing environment actually run? What 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 language or operating system or you know implementation details does it rely on? Yeah, and so the best and probably the only place that I could find like any details on this was in a long blog post by Omar. What's his last name? I can't remember, but he described making a GeoKit, which is a mapping, you could say application, but it's more of a kit where you have different parts of a, the usual map application, like the map, the zooming um, in and out, the, the scrolling and panning, that sort of stuff. And he described like how it was made and constructed in dynamic land. And that got kind of got you really concrete sense of what it was like to program in the system. And uh, so to start, the colored pieces of paper, they have programs on them. And the way that you would write something onto the piece of paper is that you would take a keyboard also attached with colored pieces of paper. So then the system, the real talk system can recognize the keyboard as one of the dynamic medium, dynamic objects in the whole room. So when you point your keyboard with the colored dots to another piece of paper, it'll project the code of that piece of paper onto that piece of paper so you can edit it. And then once you're finishing finish editing, you can print it from a laser printer. <laughs> and then you can throw away the old one and then you have your new program that you can use as part of the, the room. And so that, that's kind of interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, just to iterate, we, we said that at the, the top of, of the talk, but this, these colored dots that you keep referencing are presumably some way for the object tracking system in, in, in dynamic land to kind of keep track of these, these yeah. objects or at, at least mark to the system that this is a kind of living object versus just an arbitrary object. So, so these, these pieces of paper, when you lay them out, the, the system knows their identity, knows the information that they contain, is able to project uh, light onto them to project some type of interface. And, and the other interesting thing that I didn't know about until I was researching this podcast is that you can have the objects in in this environment point to each other. And right. so rather than having a mouse that has exposes a little cursor and and that's how you uh, select things, you can you know have little tilty wheels, you can have you know arrows that are like this is the target of this action that I want to perform. Right, right. We, we, we can get to that. But like instead of a, a mouse, you just pick up the piece of paper. Like that's direct embodiment. Like there's no such yeah. thing as a mouse cursor because you can just use your, use your hands to pick stuff up. And the, the pointing that you're talking about, like the pieces of paper 
can directly reference like other pieces of paper. And so that's that's why you put them next to each other because there's a spatial sense of relating to each other. And so in in programs, we have something called spaghetti code where like any part of the system can connect to any part of the system and it becomes like a giant mess, right? And so because it's really hard to reason about things, but like if you constrain it so that it's in the physical space to at least two dimensions, then there is at least some way to organize. Like, you know, if like something is spatially over there, it's probably not related to something spatially over there. Now, I like given it's probably not strictly true because there is the real talk language and the real talk OS that I, I think you can reference certain things. But like that, that in order to construct programs, like you would just put things next to each other. And then also what, to your point earlier about the colored dots, like that is just an implementation detail that a lot of people focus on too. Like they think that yeah. the point is that, oh, you have this computer vision system that detects these things. But really it's just, I mean, I think if Brett Victor had his way, like the system would be able to recognize any object as being like a embodied dynamic object but you know this is just the way that it's easier to do and so so that's one and two oftentimes the screenshots and the videos it was too hard to, like too small to read like what the code actually looks like and so in omar's blog post like you could see what it actually was and uh, to my surprise it was a declarative language and it's akin to data log and ah, our <laughs> old friend right our old friend from uh, season one, episode 10, the very last 10, last yeah. episode. And so it's not, uh, when I asked people that have experience with it, they told me that the language lineage was more akin to Linda, which I had to look up. It's some sort of concurrent programming language. But the real talk language is declarative and it only has four concepts in it, a wish, a claim, an introduction to a new thing and relating pages to each other. and this, uh, for those of you that do any logic programming it's and data log, it's similar to those systems in which you say a fact and then you make claims about the relationships to them. And so when you make a claim, which is the number two concept in real talk, it's like, it's akin to a fact in logic programming. So like you would say claim Bill is a parent of Mary, claim Mary is a parent of John. And then the induction rules in logic programming would be the when construct. And so you would say like when something is a duck, then, you know, wish that something is labeled quack or like mm -hmm. when somebody X is a parent of Y claim that X is an ancestor of Y and so on and so forth. And so it uses the logic and declarative programming to to do a lot of these these things. And so of course you can also write Lua in these programs as an escape hatch to do some imperative things. Yeah. But for the most part it's more encouraged that you write in real talk. And so I think one of the written accounts of programming in dynamic land is it's hard to get rid of your old programming habits. And so if people think that like the transition to functional programming was tough, like, like it took a couple months for people to get used to this because your instinct is to use the pieces of paper as a screen or a monitor for writing code. And then you would just like write straight Lua code through the entire thing and end up with this huge thing, which, you know, you, you don't actually need to do. And it takes a while for you to understand that you can break these up into different pieces of functionality on the pieces of paper, and then you can construct them together by laying them next to each other or pointing them at each other. Do you know why they picked the, this uh, real talk or why they chose to model real talk after data log and uh, declarative programming? I don't really know the, the lineage or the reason why they picked it. I can just guess that the, the baggage that comes with imperative and functional programming and type systems just isn't really conducive to the goals of dynamic land. That's, that's my best guess. And so having something declarative probably made a lot of sense, but I, I don't know for sure. What do you think it is? Yeah, I have a few thoughts and, and obviously I don't have any way to corroborate this, but one thing that stands no, out to we me. We need to know of... more people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, they are purposefully a very secretive project. So you know, one of the things that stands out to me about declarative programming is the fact that you can build a declarative program incrementally because you can make an assertion, you can make a claim, oh, and you can say, I wish that some 
you know, uh, wish was fulfilled. And you don't need to have all parts of that working. So you can say, you know, I wish that a map was projected on this other uh, sheet of paper. And you don't have to have that part working yet. But if you think about how you write a, a regular program or rather an imperative program, you have to define that function. If you say, I'm going to call this function, you know, draw a map, and then you just don't have that function draw a map, your program is not going to run. So you kind of have to have all of these pieces predefined. It, it's almost like there is this design phase where you decide, okay, this is how my program is going to run. And then you have this phase at which point you can run it because you've defined all of the, the functionality of your program. And it doesn't really lend itself to it working incrementally in these physical ways, isolating yourself to one part of the problem by literally focusing your vision on the one thing that you're working on and then moving on and building on top of that. And so I think that one thing that's nice about declarative programming is that you can work incrementally because you're not really, there's no invalid state in a declarative program. You can have contradictions. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, there are, there are invalid claims, but but rather there is no crashing state other than you you make you know invalid assertions. Um, yeah, and also there's no order in logical programming. You can just rearrange them however you like, and you're always talking about the rules in the world as it is now, and then you have to explicitly put some sort of I guess time component on it in order to talk about things changing perhaps that I don't I'm not sure. Yeah. The 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 other thing that came to mind about declarative programming is that actually if you remember at the the end of the data log episode I had said something to the effect of data log would be a cool language for the metaverse because in the metaverse if you imagine that people are going to be programming yeah. this thing in in this like massive scale you don't want their logic to collide. You don't want them to have to coordinate on a single code base and, and have you know side effects and things where you're trampling over each other. And the nice thing about declarative programming, again, maybe by the the fact that it's it, it's hard to kind of get yourself into this like invalid state because there's not really a sense of statefulness and side effects in declarative programming. You can have a massive computing environment where people's programs are interacting uh, without having to worry about, you know, your module trampled over the memory of my module or it overwrote some global variable and now these two things won't play well together. And yeah. they might be able to be more compatible rather than you know, worrying about these boundaries between them. Yeah, that, that may end up being like implementation details of a computer system when, when you're kind of working at this higher level. Yeah, my guess is that yeah, I guess it goes back to it just seems more conducive to the goals of dynamic land with these nice properties. Yeah, I don't know for sure, but I think one of the things, some things that you say. And so I guess I could beg the question, like, why isn't all programming like that? Well, like, the, I, I've tried writing logic programming. It takes a lot of getting used to when you, I guess you can say you're brain damaged in other ways by writing imperative <laughs> and functional stuff. But I, I, yeah, I don't know. That, that's, that might be a question for a different episode. But yeah, so so I, I guess the the interesting thing here is it reminds the, the writing code here was also surprising in that Real Talk uses the physical world as part of its implementation. That I thought was a pretty critical and deep insight into what it's like to use Dynamic Land and some of the yeah like a, a fundamental thing about it. And so a lot of the times when we program computer systems, we end up having to write a lot of code that makes something intuitive for humans. And so one good example is the bounce at the end of a scroll list on Apple iPhones, right? And so mm -hmm. when you reach the end of the list and it springs, you're like, oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense, right? Like it, there's, there's like that, it feels good. It, it, it seems like that's what lists of dynamic stuff would do if it actually existed in the physical world. But the reality is that we have to spend a lot of time and effort to program all these things in there because the rules of the physical world is not there by default in the uh, digital world. And so a uh, dynamic land is different. 
if you need a list, you don't create a list container. You just arrange the pages in the list. If you need a slider, you don't create a UI and GUI with a slider with like event handlers for when the slider moves around and stuff like that. Uh, you just use one of the colored dot papers that respond to a popsicle stick with a colored dot and you just read where the popsicle stick is and then send that off uh, somewhere else. And the popsicle stick's position along the paper would act as the slider. And so if you need a dial, like a, a zoom dial, so like one of the examples in Omar's post about his creation of GeoKit is that he needed like a, a zoom dial, like a twisty knob thingy. And yep. so instead of implementing that in GUI and then having the controls for it and having the simulated inertia and the virtual drag handle, he just used like a coast, like a coaster, like with ball bearings. And he put colored dot paper on top of that rotating thing. And he, you can just rotate that and mm -hmm. the system will detect like what the position of that thing will be. And that's how you get a zoom. So you don't have to re-implement all that. Like that's how... Real talk is able to be relatively minimalistic because it really leans heavily on the physical world to implement all these UI, UX sort of things that we normally have to implement in our dynamic systems, in other other computing platforms and environments ourselves. Yeah, I I always make this reference. I've made it a couple times in this podcast, but if you think about sci-fi computing environments like you know, in the minority report or something where people have these like you know, virtual screens that uh, they can fling here and there and they pinch them and they zoom them and, you know, scroll around on them. Real computing environments don't look anything like that. They look completely flat and honestly boring, kind of boring. to look at on movies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and so and like people figured out how to represent text messaging on movies, right? Like yeah, I remember a little bubble people, that comes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They used to have <laughs> trouble figuring out how to do that. Or like how do you how do you make people write on whiteboards? And so they figured out, oh, let's just make everybody write on clear whiteboards and let's let's beautiful mind the shit by like writing on the window, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. That that's but, solving but, like cinematic problems. Like nobody actually does that. Yeah, exactly. But it makes actually a lot of sense that something that makes sense for a movie to do, what they're basically trying to do is convey the sense of what's happening, the dynamism of whatever, you know, computing is going on at that moment you know, to the viewer. And that gets lost in our flat surfaces. And so it kind of makes sense that as you're describing all these little pieces of paper and, you know, a little dial that people are spinning in order to, you know, zoom in or what, pan or whatever it is, it kind of feels a little bit like the Minority Report or whatever sci-fi computing environment. Of course, if you look at the pictures, it doesn't look like that. It doesn't look like blue glowing screens that are are you know, floating in the air. It looks actually a lot more quaint. It looks like a little art project. Which, which yeah. I guess we'll get to. But like, I guess if you can look beyond the like implementation, like it 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 uh, serves a similar purpose, which I believe is what you're getting to, right? It's. Uh, yeah space that we humans can understand that serves to facilitate a shared understanding, right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, like if, if you can sort of psych yourself up into seeing the spirit of what's going on, I think you can imagine that this is a path towards those sort of by movie computing environments. It, it doesn't look like that, but it very much is maybe a precursor to or you know a more real realistic version of, of that same thing Good point like when when you're talking about how movies try to find ways to solve their movie problems like this is part of embodiment right they're trying to figure out like how do we at least have a visual representation of what's going on in our characters heads and and like they figured out like a variety of different ways and dynamic land is trying to do the same thing and so you can think of it as a way that in order for people to work with the system, they have to have their thoughts out in the open and so that anybody else can kind of come by and look at it at a glance and be able to see, oh, okay, I kind of get the sense of what's going on. It does remind me of, you know that uh, movie about Alpha Mind and Go? I often, they, they did have a section where they had a visual animation of what Alpha Go was doing, but 
I wish that you could get that visualization as they were playing rather than the old school commentators on like a magnetic board showing you like that thing because there's there is a anime called Hikaru, Hikaru no Go and it's basically just about a kid that ends up being like a grandmaster in Go and one of the visualization they had was like how he analyzed the pattern and the way that they portrayed it was that he was exploring different branches of like the Go play and so you yeah. can see the board as it was being played out in various variations and options and so you could see that sort of stuff but I think you can go even a step further in like highlighting, basically syntax highlighting for Go boards where you can see like, oh, this is a danger area or this is something else, right? Like some yeah. representation of what's going on in people's minds as they're thinking these abstract thoughts. And of course, like, is it actually like what people envision when they're like grandmaster Go players? I have no idea. For me, programming, I would be hard pressed to find a visual representation also, but I know there's like some version of that that's going on that that's hard for me to visualize like there is some sense of space as i've constructed in my head and there's some version of like reasoning about that thing but like i can't exactly transcribe it on the screen or as as an object on the screen right but but you do you yeah. get that same set yeah definitely i think that's what i was referring to when you know i was saying that there are assumptions about who is a programmer and right now our assumption of who is a programmer is somebody who is good at abstract thinking. And by abstract thinking, basically, it seems to me that we have all these really dead artifacts. We have you know, screens full of code that describe how the system would run if you were to run it. You don't actually get to see it run un until you hit run, but, but you can see this. And, and the job of the programmer is to look at the, this code, read it, and somehow in their mind, you know, execute it or understand its nature and watch it unroll and from there say okay this is what i need to change about this in order to you know fix this bug or make it do we're something effect else we're effectively like simulating computers in our heads as we're like typing stuff into the the tech yeah exactly and, and another big aspect of programming is being able to understand the relations between the different software components at a variety of levels, so between you know the your your business logic and the library that it relies on, or the different components that are running within your server, or your different microservices that are running in the context of your entire you know a distributed system, all of these things kind of have some type of relation. You can imagine that uh, microservice A is you know, doing something, sending messages to microservice B. It's not actually like sending anything, but you can sort of imagine that that's what's happening. And that, that's one way, one metaphor by which you can imagine the behavior of a system. Or you can, you know, if you think about uh, a debate, it uses a lot of kind of spatial metaphors. Like you can step into a function. What does it mean to step into a function? A function is not a place, but you're basically imagining a stack, a calling stack, and you're going deeper down yeah. into it and stepping out of it. And so there's a lot, all of these kind of spatial metaphors that people rely on, but people don't really talk about them because it's all just sort of internalized and the people who are good at this kind of thing don't really need to, to say it out loud. And, and the interesting thing about dynamic land is it's kind of taking that assumption and saying, okay, we're actually just going to make all of the spatial thing that's happening inside these special people's heads. We're just going to make it out in the real world for everybody to interact with. Yeah, yeah. And and so we're going to simplify it, rely on the physical world as part of its implementation and space just a way to splay out what somebody's thoughts are in a dynamic medium. Yeah. yeah. And so, so with that, I, I, I think that that's, those are the things that make dynamic land really interesting, different. And I think it has the potential to be a thinking tool uh, for civilization. <laughs> like, I mean, like, I guess this goes to the part of our episode where we talk about like what are the second and third order effects like when people like kind of get this or when it is more publicly available like how will it change things because i know like one of the uh, stated goals for dynamic land is that it's like a public resource kind of like libraries are Library. today right and and so like libraries we typically think of them as 
for checking out books, but you know, they're, they're like communal resources. Like you can do, I don't know, check out laptops and DVDs and go there. There's like community events and stuff like that. So there's a lot of like different kinds of things that you can do at a library. And so he's envisioning that this would be like a public space where you, I guess you would rent out or do it communally in which like you can think together like with, it's kind of like you have, let's say you have like policy problems for the local government, like does enacting this policy like make sense? So you would be able to ingest data from the different sources and then explore that the effects of that policy on the community with the data that you have in a way that's out in the open. So you can talk about it together, right? And do presentations mm-hmm. that, that way, or like just as a discussion for policy makers. And so I think that is really it's really interesting like it's it's a new potential for people to get on the same understanding and same page about things yeah so on the dynamic land website they have a a roadmap a timeline and the goal is that by 2040 there's going to be a dynamic land in every neighborhood following this library model that you are are mentioning And like, we actually don't have to try to extrapolate out this thing in in this episode, (laughs) like, like some of our other episodes, because they explicitly tell us like what they want to do. Like, they're like, this is step three in a 50 year project. So I guess that's that's great. (laughs) It saves us some work. But yeah, I think that it's a little bit of a utopian uh, vision, but you can imagine that a lot of the things that we endlessly debate about in in community spaces are things that we're unable to immediately reason about what happens if we you know build a bus that passes through you know this neighborhood or what happens if we open a highway here what will it increase the traffic in our in in this neighborhood will it potentially bring a business because it shortens the commute time et cetera, et cetera. And I can imagine that in the future, you could have a dynamic land or a part of your community's dynamic land where people are playing around with these different models where somebody can say, hey, I, actually this model doesn't really account for you know, this effect on, you know, let's say the uh, safety of, of children and we should actually model like traffic accidents or accidents with, with pedestrians and they can sort of add their own layer to the simulation and then people can play around with it again and sort of come to some shared understanding and and obviously i say that this is utopian because you know kind of assumes that everybody is you know really nice and collaborative and benevolent and like not just trying to like twist this policy (laughs) it's outside the scope here but i mean like i think it's good to have like ideals to shoot for and you know like and whether you actually reach it or not is it is something that you have to get people on the same train for, but at least it, it's ideals are, are goals rather than like, it, it's the yeah. North star sort of thing. And so, yeah, uh, yeah. but the thing is like what, what we're talking about in that scenario isn't, isn't just something we're hand waving around. Like the, I'll, this is the first time I'll first, maybe last time that I'll read something here, but it's from one of the dynamic land researchers, Luke Inan, Iannini never actually pronounced that, but uh, about his experiences with Omar's GeoKit. And basically he said that the real estate group that owns the building in dynamic land that lives in uses their purchasing power to influence the city to improve the infrastructure to the underserved areas of Oakland they develop in. The head of this initiative was visiting the space, dynamic land, and she began describing her work while they were gathered around the lunch table, which happened to have a GeoKit spread across it looking at Oakland. Without breaking flow of conversation, I dealt the transit card to display the bus routes, and she grabbed the zoom and, dial, zoom and pan dial without any instruction to zoom in on a portion of West Oakland, noticed a huge hole in route coverage she'd never seen before where she knew there were tons of working families. We spent the next 15 minutes exploring as she taught me more about the city's transit details than I ever knew I wanted to know. And so this is a, a concrete example of how dynamic land has these dynamic objects to facilitate a conversation and a shared understanding of like what's going on. And normally you, you wouldn't be able to do this on your phone. It's just the, the medium and the form factor is just wrong for it. And you would think that iPad maybe, but it hasn't turned out that way. The best thing that I can see the iPad as being so far are cash registers. 
that's been a game changer. <laughs> but uh, and maybe like conference room, a conference room, yeah, displays, yeah, like yeah. <laughs> displays or or like I don't know stuff stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. So so I, I think that that that's that's kind of what based on these sort of anecdotes, like that's why we're seeing these like where it could potentially be a shared place for policymakers to do that sort of stuff. And in, in the... yeah, and a lot of the anecdotes on the usage of dynamic land did mention the fact that they've had people visit who are not programmers or are not technical in the classical sense. So like they're not technically trained and these people are able to come into dynamic land and be able to get a sense of what these things do and interact with them. And maybe to some extent also add their own logic or, or su at least suggest, oh, maybe we can make it do this thing instead in a way that if you look at a software program running on even something like an iPad, you actually don't have any sense of what are the components that make this thing run and, oh, maybe it, like we can tweak this part of the system here. It's all completely opaque to you. Yeah, and you have you to wait a week for like a programmer to tweak that thing to the chagrin, is, is the chagrin uh, to like yeah. anybody that has to work with programmers. And I've had like people looking over my shoulder trying to like fix something. I'm like, I can't do this. You need to go away. I can't think with somebody like looking over my shoulder. But like right. dynamic uh, is completely different, right? You can just move stuff around and, and put it together and it it the the feedback loop is much much shorter so that if you have a suggestion you can just do it immediately yeah exactly so i think that you know even if you you know forget the super utopian of you know all the community is going to band together and collaboratively solve very contentious issues even groups of people whose values are aligned and who do want to work together don't have tools like this right now. And so having this kind of shared computational medium where people of different functions, right now we we split up you know technical work into you know, software engineers, product managers, you know, UI people, designers, and these people kind of throw documents and files and ideas over the fence at each other and wait for them to implement and and then iterate. So imagine rather than having these such strong divisions, people were all able to come together and see the effects of their ideas, suggest new ones, and be able to, to kind of riff the same way that musicians riff with each other, I think could open up a lot of possibilities for you know ways of working that are completely impossible right now. What sort of things do you think it'll change? Because I guess we mentioned like maybe policy making, but like I, I guess computing is applied to so many things you can just basically say everything. But do you have like specific ideas yeah. of like how this might change? Yeah, I mean, you know, so many of the important things in this world are run on Excel. And I think Excel is a, you know, a simulation or an approximation of this kind of shared computing environment because you see these cells and you see them change and like you can if you're using google sheets or something you can look at them together change together and so i imagine that you know financial projections or you know statistical analysis for something like running a, a clinical trial all of these things that are run on these spreadsheets you could you could bring into something like dynamic land and shorten their iteration times and allow different stakeholders who would otherwise say, okay, now we need to pass this to the analyst, to the statistician, to the whatever magic, you know, uh, magician to run their, you know, incantations and then come back to us with the results. You can all just look at it together. So I think that running a business, you can you, you bring in different people and, and allow them to kind of understand how, you know, profits are going to look or hey what if we tweak this aspect of, of uh, our business how is it going to affect our revenues and it's like democratizing yeah. the understanding of this the system yeah i wonder how that would work well so so yeah i mean like have you been in meetings where people are like oh like what is that number and then people pull it out of their ass or, or pull it out of their heads about like what their stuff is maybe yeah. that happens but then there aren't usually a lot of 
what if scenarios to explore before making a decision like usually it's like some sort of action item say hey get back to me on this or like if there's requires some sort of analysis they like kick it over to the data scientist and say i need this tomorrow to and the data yeah. science like we had other priorities or this is not what we do <laughs> we don't generate reports <laughs> um right it's so, a poor data scientist and and so usually yeah, like this decision making takes place over the course of multiple meetings is, is my understanding. I haven't worked in a lot of big companies, so I'm relying on you to tell me whether this is the case or not. Yeah, and and oftentimes it's like a small suggestion that would be really trivial to to implement, but because you know, you need to wait for the right person to make that change and then deploy it and then see its effects on traffic or whatever it is. It, it takes a long iteration time. And of course, there are some things that you can't just simulate, but there are a lot of things like, well, how does the performance of this model vary if we, you know, tweak this one parameter? Well, you yeah. could do, you could run that analysis like right away, but you can't until the next meeting because, you know, the person who just suggested it, it, it can't interact with this model. Yeah, I was thinking that maybe the boardroom version of Dynamic Land, probably like Brett Victor's like, well, he's not dead yet, but what's the living version <laughs> of rolling in his grave? Um, yeah, yeah. But, I don't know, but yeah. Yeah, what, whatever it is, is that in like a conference room would have something similar, but it would have access to the company's data lake or database. Mm -hmm. And so they can do, I guess, simulated projections of like what happens if we change pricing. Like based on our historic data, like what would happen if we change pricing? So that means yeah. that like maybe you can have colored dots that do querying because we know that data log can be a query language. And if real talk is anything like data log, then you should be able to query data that way. Yeah. And then be able to do some transformations to show like, oh, what happens when we... Yeah, I think you can insert like new facts into data log and then see what the, use it as an inference engine to see what the outcomes might be without, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so. Yeah, I mean, I think like, like you something like Atomic similar. allows yeah. you to, to, to play around with that or, or. You yeah, know, without committing it to, too. Without yeah. committing it. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, I think that that's definitely a valid use case. Yeah. Huh. Uh, yeah, that uh, sounds like a startup. So like, <laughs> our <laughs> listeners out there, maybe you should go out there and build this. And yeah. Brett Victor will be rolling in his. I don't know. Bed. Bed. <laughs> <laughs> don't know. Rolling in his sleep, maybe. But it, another thing that that is exciting to me is what I'm going to call throwaway computing. Right now, computing is so hard to do and so special that we don't really have little throwaway programs because it's not cheap to produce. But you can imagine that there are all kinds of spreadsheets like we have spreadsheets. yeah we have versions of this but like it's not yeah yeah but like it's it's not general enough to solve all kinds of problems that you would traditionally kick to some underling and then they get stressed out that they have to do this tomorrow and they got other stuff to do right yeah exactly and and, and even like you know out of the context of a corporation even something like in, in the home recently i was working out a shared budget with somebody and it was hard to visualize like okay this is how much money we're going to be left with if you know the market has this kind of return if we like you know take this and it, we invest it and it has this kind of return and we have this expense or that expense or you know we vary this parameter or that parameter or like what happens if i you know take a year off of work like what how does that affect like our five-year uh plan and you can do that in a spreadsheet, but it kind of feels more like something that you want to just constantly tweak. You you want to see like, oh, I'm going to remove this parameter out of this equation, and you just like lift something off, and you see how it changes the outcome, and then you put it back, and, and you see how it changes the outcome. It just feels like a kind of self-contained computational problem. And, and I think there are many of those throughout our daily life where, you know, if we just had... Uh, a medium the same way that we can just like write some calculations on a piece of paper and and run that computation in our in our mind if we were able to have a living medium that was able to do even fancier computations you'd be able to do this for all kinds of like small life scenarios as well yeah i guess financials is is the thing that come to mind immediately i was trying to think of whether there are other things that like i might use a dynamic medium for but 
I think it's one of those things where you're not used to it. If you like discover a pen and paper and you've never like written anything, you're like, but what should I write? <laughs> so you're not going to like come up with a to-do list immediately out of the blue, right? Like mother yeah. necessity is the mother of all invention. So it might yeah. take a little I, while to kind of think about this. I, I have some other approximations of, of things that, that dynamic land could solve. So right now I have a, an issue with sort of getting into a flow state at work. And so what I've done is that I have programmed a shortcut on my phone using iOS shortcuts that when I put it on my desk, there's an NFC tag on my desk and it reacts to being tapped on that NFC tag. And it sets my phone in, in a work mode. And by setting my phone in work mode, it activates some other script that runs on my laptop that like blocks, you know, time-wasting websites. That's and, and pretty cool. How long did it take for you to make it? Hopefully not it, longer than it. Not, not, lo not longer than <laughs> yeah, the time okay. that's saved, no. Other it, XKCD yeah. reference, yeah. <laughs> Yes. So basically, it, it, for this, this case, it, it worked out, you know, using the existing tools. But basically what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make my life and all my working environments reactive to some, you know, something, whatever I'm oh. doing. Yeah, right. like the, the habits that you build, like your your devices, your computing environment reacts to you getting into the, doing the habit to get into the flows. Yeah, exactly. And so I think that a dynamic land or a computing environment, embodied computing environment is, uh, you know, a way to do that. And and also, you know, basically what what I'm trying to do is something very similar to what dynamic land is trying to do. I'm trying to make my phone aware of where it is in my house and by the nature of where it is, change its behavior or change the behavior of some other interface, namely my laptop, right? Like a crude approximation, but yeah, like instead of yeah. colored pieces of paper, you can imagine like real world stuff. I guess this goes back to our end user programming sort of thing where like we're trying to imbue the things around us with magic, but here like the intent is not, just for convenience, like dynamic land, the intent is to help understand dynamic systems, I guess. And so, so then yeah. mm, I wonder if like, if you, I was wondering, like you were mentioned, like having this in the home, if yeah. the house could also monitor your habits of behavior and patterns, you could feed that back into, like you can explore that data on like a, kitchen table or like the the dining the living room coffee table to be able to see what your patterns of behavior are and then i guess you could conceivably like set it to lock your refrigerator so that you don't eat after ten, eight or something like that i mean yeah uh but, so but actually I that's, actually that's... i i have i have done this i i have <laughs> a, a little arduino powered lock on one of my cabinets that oh, uh, only opens between some certain times uh, so yeah i mean I, I, right. I, I but but like once again like i think brett, brett victor would be rolling around right now but yeah like the, yeah. these are these are kind of like more like daily conveniences they're not like dynamic systems i think like what we are talking about in the boardroom are probably like more akin to it like consumer sort of things maybe like if i un try to understand my en energy usage based on like my habits patterns of use and stuff like that maybe something like that like over the course of months helps me figure out like what my like usage patterns are maybe something like that makes a little I'll, sense. I will I will object to this line of thinking so I'm a big fan of the fact uh, of the idea that when a creator puts something out into the world they no longer have a monopoly on the discourse that is around it and so Brett Victor great guy might might have a particular use that that he imagines for visualizing or understanding really dynamic systems but i think that if you think about the promise of computing people you know i okay i'll make this argument yeah yeah your one's whole life is a dynamic system and by making people able to program aspects of their life and also understand and observe aspects of their life, you are, are helping them solve the, the most important system to them of all. And I, I'm being slightly facetious here, but if you think about the average person compared to somebody like you or me, the extent to which they are able to adapt their life or make the things around them adapt to the desires of their life, they, they can only do that if somebody makes a product for them. 
And the fact that like if they could have a system like Dynamic Land in their house that reacts and has logic that reflects their desires, that is actually enabling them to live differently than they otherwise would, which I think is not a, it's not just a, oh yeah, like I have a smart doorbell that I can like look out of. It is actually a very empowering thing. I guess to to that point, I mean, I mean, hypertext or hypermedia researchers never envisioned that people would be sending around cat pics on the internet. Like that, that wasn't a use case that they were thinking about, right? Yeah. yeah. Like neither, wasn't it Mark Andreessen that invented the image tag? I think so. Yeah. I don't think he, is that right? I don't know. Well, either way, like, I don't think he envisioned the cat pic. Yeah, I mean, the, the I, I referenced this a couple of times, like Brett Victor rolling around his bed. I think one of the reasons why you don't have a lot of information out there on dynamic land is because I think Brett Victor is somebody that cares a lot about the deep ideas behind things. And, you know, by nature, he's a researcher. And he's seen what happened at like Xerox Park, where the GUI, object oriented programming, and a whole bunch of other things were invented. And he felt like Silicon Valley entrepreneurs pilfered it for ideas, but then just made shallow copies of these things to sell to the market. And for example, the GUI was meant, and like the GUI was meant as a way for people to change programs in an embodied way and then object oriented programming was part of the small talk system where you have an entire programming environment and object orientation as it exists today is not yeah it, it's nothing like small talk like it, it's it's a different thing altogether it just has that heritage and lineage and so because of that i think he i've read that he said that you know engineers should stop working on things like uber because like life's little inconveniences are just not important problems. Like he's, he hopes like dynamic land is used for scientists um, trying to solve like larger problems. And so I, I, I don't know, I, I don't fault him for that because like he has to have a stance, right? When, when you have yeah. a stance because it stems from values that you have. And so, but on the other hand, like you said, like anything that is a technology it's it's got multiple edges not just two and so if you intend on making hypermedia to spread information to the world i mean people are going to use it for cat pics and porn so i mean like <laughs> that, that, that doesn't mean that you can't use it for those other things but yeah like you said like once something is released into the world people are going to find all sorts of ways to use it that that you really just don't have control and don't have say to it and so i think a lot of uh more traditional media like artists and musicians have gotten used to this idea more because like there's a facilitation of conversation that you have after your creation is released, right? Yeah. Whereas I think, yeah, software, do you think it's like that? Maybe a little. Yeah, I mean, actually like software is just an artifact which is received. Like the software you as a user, well, either use it as it's intended or, or not. Right. And... But con consumer wise, but then there are corners of like open source is, is more akin to that where you kind of do to get that feedback, but I don't know, there's no f fever around it. Like, like people are yeah. not like fans of, I don't know, like react or I don't know what S open SSH as they are of like game of Thrones <laughs> or like the rest yeah. of development or something like that. So, yeah. yeah. So yeah, we were, we were just talking in the last episode of sort of NFTs and things being the sort of memification of yeah. what are ultimately like uh, programmable objects. And so I think that's the closest that we can come to, like where people can put something out and then other people can sort of permissionlessly riff and take it in a different direction. But yeah. like, yeah, other than that, there isn't really any equivalent. At least with, well, open source, but it's it's not nearly as easy. I mean, in spirit, it's supposed to be like that, but it's not nearly as easy as riffing on NFTs and memes and stuff like that. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the, the permissionless aspect is important to, as well, because in Dynamic Land, if you look at some of the pictures, basically all of these programs are stored in uh, little folders or envelopes on, on shelves, and you can just sort of take somebody's program and l lay it out, run it, and then make a copy and, and uh, put your own twist on it. Yeah. And so there isn't really a, a permission system or even a version control system by which you commit control. something yeah. and so yeah the, in, in that sense it's very permissionless uh, 
that reminds me a lot of our discussion of uh, permissionlessness in NFTs. And I think open source, you know, there there are lots of horror stories and things, but like it's very hard to modify an uh, open source project unless you have some clout. As, uh, as particularly, yeah. The, as I mean, ones. programmers celebrate when they get their PRs in, right? So. Yeah, yeah. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of gatekeeping just as part of that process. And so, yeah, it's. I think it's only nominally open. It's not open in the way that Dynamic Land is is imagining that that a software system is open. Yeah, yeah. So. I think going back to kind of what, if the ideas in dynamic land are more prevalent, like how would our society and civilization change? There, there's, I think there's probably like, oh, things outside of like understanding like policy and scientific things that, that are probably useful for. I can imagine games actually, like a different kind of interactive game where people are playing in a room and the dynamic objects facilitate that interaction so if you've ever done like i guess improv or improv games yeah. like there might be some version of that that involved dynamic objects like where they keep a state counter or something like that 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 yeah. might be creative and interesting another one might be what do they call those plays where the audience is on in like the the room is the stage where both the audience and the actors are in it Oh yeah, yeah. I I, I don't know uh, the particular name, but yeah, where yeah. where the kind of audience can also participate. Kind of like they they can like eavesdrop, like you know, like yeah. obviously you don't like interrupt the actors or something like that, and they might yeah. like improv a little if you interact with them. Um, yeah. But I can see something like that where you it's not only the actors that are dynamic, but the objects in the world uh, are dynamic too. So like when you change the state of something, then it might help direct the actors to do a different thing or even just like the, the shape of the room changes or like the, yeah, mm -hmm. like something like that. I can, I can see like people like playwrights trying to take advantage of this thing. Cause I think up in SF, there's something like this. I forgot what it was called. Um, where, where there's kind of like a general script and like you as the audience member are dressed in the 1920s and you just go and observe the actors doing stuff and you can interact yeah. with them and they'll pull you aside and talk to you about like the people that you've seen and so you can piece together a nonlinear story with different characters and how they kind of connect to each other yeah totally i mean i can i can imagine that it'd be really fun to run a murder mystery party or something uh, <laughs> where you have like you know, clues reveal themselves in reaction to different events, and 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 that's just sort of a game, but it's a it's a sort of embodied game, right? Because people are acting, people are role playing, you, you know, they're looking around the house for clues. Could be fun. Yeah, something like that. Or I guess in the future, where you don't have to have colored dots, then you could have the room make music in response to the shape or the position of your body. So when people are dancing, like there's yeah. a feedback loop between the dancers and the music. I, yeah, I can see like people that are artists being being interested in that kind of concept. Yeah, yeah. So I, I mean, also, you know, to clarify, a lot of the shows that are in the tours of Dynamic Land are kind of fun in games. It's not oh, yeah, a yeah. sort of serious place where people are like deeply thinking about all the world's problems. Of course, there's that vision going on. But it's also like a fun place. It's like kind of a cool workshop where people are are having fun as well. So I think that you know we shouldn't sort of oversell the the depth, the, the uh, long term uh, vision of like the fifty hundred year version of yeah. it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, a lot of the the things that you you see are like really fun things, like putting googly eyes or like I don't know what what else. It, like a lot of them look like light shows, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Like light shows with like little interactive characters you know, cartoons, cartoonish type things being projected. So yeah, I think it's, it, there's, there's sort of a sense of fun. And, and, and going back to the sort of the aesthetic, I mean, of course, the colored dots are, are an implementation detail and maybe have some meaning in the object tracking, but, you know, they didn't have to make them quite so colorful. I think that's a design choice to sort of make it friendly and fun to use. You know, like people can, we, we talked about the interfaces that you can make yourself from everyday objects. And so it, does feel more like an arts and crafts project where you have the agency to use glue or popsicle sticks or anything else to kind of make your ideas and programs come. Yeah. So, you know, I, I really hope that one day, maybe once 
you know, the group feels more confident that they have crystallized their idea and made it more resistant to sort of commodification and commercialization. One day they sort of open it up and I hope to sort of go see what this thing is all about because, you know, from all the accounts that I've heard, you can talk about it as much as you want, you can read about it as much as you want, but there is some intangible feel to actually going and interacting with this with this computing environment. And so, so yeah, hopefully get to check it out. Yeah, it's like we're we're just like you we're watching like people play Minecraft and trying to like talk about like what it's like to play Minecraft by watching other yeah. people play Minecraft. It's not quite the same. And so so at best we can guess. And so yeah, I hope one day to be able to kind of go there ourselves and I guess maybe we'll, we'll see if we get an invite from this episode. Maybe long, long after. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Red Victor, if you're watching this, yeah, please, please invite us. And we we promise we're not going to pull a Steve Jobs at Park on you. And, uh, <laughs> steal, <laughs> steal we, we got other things to do. All right. Yeah. So so with that, how, how's your optimism? It's good. I mean, so I I think maybe it's the hemp or something, but like I'm feeling really <laughs> good right now. And also... You know, I have bought into Brett Victor's inclusive vision of the world, and I am feeling embodied. I'm really excited about it because I guess I'm interested in the idea that programming is not what we think it is. Like, we think we know programming, but maybe we just really don't yet. And this puts a, forward a vision of computing outside of what we usually think about it. And it's pretty interesting in that sense and so with that i i hope that we can in his vision make a better world through it and also i guess not in his vision we can make all sorts of fun things to to entertain ourselves if not through dynamic thinking yeah so. cool all right so well with that that's another episode so yeah well uh, comment what you think what you would use dynamic land for that's a new call to action now please comment yes. on our videos like subscribe subscribe all that good stuff yeah. ring, ring the bell whatever it is yeah yeah exactly and and uh, yeah so w with that this is will and this is Shri. and we'll see you again next week for another episode of the technium where we talk about some other edge of technology all right see ya cool see ya bye-bye